Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. I have a special guest with me tonight. His name is Adam Collins. He is an organizer for Student Loan Justice. Alan, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Sabrina. Glad to be with you. So, Alan, I, I think it's interesting uh, because... When I invited you on, we did not have the news that just broke today. So it just it just happens to have worked out <laughs> that you're coming on tonight when this okay. news broke. But um, I do want to start with uh, the Student Loan Justice Organization. Why did you decide to start that organization and what made you so passionate about student loan debt to begin with? Yeah, you know, I had my own student loans and still do today. Um, I graduated like 1998 or nine or so. And uh, my own loans got thrown into default despite my best efforts to keep them in good stead. And at the time, I was an aeronautical scientist at Caltech uh, after leaving that job. And I, interestingly, I went into banking. I went to, into federal banking uh, for the Department of Transportation. And what I saw happen with my own student loans was an alarm bell. I realized immediately after I had sort of, sort of learned a little bit about the banking industry and good faith loans and so on and so forth, I realized that something, something had gone horribly wrong with the federal student loan program. So. I started doing some research and what I found was just jaw dropping, the, the collusion, the corruption. And I wound up taking my research to 60 Minutes and I wound up uh, being featured top story in 2006. And it was a ground. It was a kind of a big deal back at the time. Um, unfortunately, I thought, OK, well, that's mission accomplished. And that was 16 years ago now. So unfortunately, um, this lending scam, and it is a scam through and through, uh, has only gotten worse since those long ago days. And the battle still continues. You know, this lending system is just, it is a mess. It is a monstrous weaponized scam. And I hope we can talk about that a little later. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, I, I first want to start with the news that broke today. I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen for this. For those who are not aware, um, there has been a change in the student loan uh, forgiveness plan that the Biden administration did announce. And, and I want to share this with everyone. Uh, Biden administration scales back student loan forgiveness plan as states sue. So I want to share uh, a little bit of this article here. The Biden administration scaled back eligibility for its student loan forgiveness plan Thursday. That was today, uh, the same day six Republican-led states sued President Joe Biden in an effort to block his student loan forgiveness plan from taking effect. Borrowers who, whose federal student loans are guaranteed by the government but held private lenders will now be excluded from receiving debt relief. Around 770,000 people will be affected by the change. Now, that's according to an administration uh, official. The Department of Education initially said these loans, many of which made under the former Federal Family Education Plan program and Federal Ferk uh, Perkins uh, Loan Program, would be eligible for one-time forgiveness action as long as the borrower consolidated his or her debt into the federal direct loan program. On Thursday, the department reversed course. According to its website, privately held federal student loans must have been consolidated before September 29th, which is today, in order to be eligible for the debt relief. So now we see uh, there is a change here. And one more piece I wanna mention, Borrowers with privately held federal student loans represent a small portion of 43 million federal student loan borrowers. There are about 4 million borrowers with the federal family education loans, but not all of those people are likely to be eligible for the loan forgiveness plan, which also includes an income requirement. 
Alan, I, I want to get your take on this because, like I said, this news broke today, uh, and we've been talking about student loans, I'd say, for like the past, I don't know, four weeks uh, on this show. And I know some people have already reached out to me. That's how I found out about this, reached out to me today to let me know that they are now uh, no longer eligible. So I want to get your take on this. Yeah, you know, our group actually started the petition back in March 2020. Uh, calling on the president to cancel student loans by executive order. This is way before anybody was talking about it. So you'd think we'd be thrilled that Biden came out and announced this loan cancellation. But, you know, Sabrina, we knew that this plan was going to be fraught with problems and uh, say one thing, do another, it, that it would be um, weakened and weakened and weakened. Uh, and then, you know, well after the election, people would realize Hey, this thing sucks. And quite frankly, you know, ten or twenty thousand dollar loan forgiveness, uh, that does very little for the people who have been hurt worse by these loans. We have people who borrowed, you know, twenty five thousand dollars, who have repaid a hundred thousand dollars on a twenty five thousand dollar loan, still owe, you know, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. That's the sort of predatory abuse that we're seeing. So. From the get-go, ten or even twenty thousand dollars doesn't do a whole lot for the people worst hurt. And that news that you just mentioned that just dropped today—that's just one more shoe, one of many shoes to drop that will weaken and weaken and weaken this loan cancellation plan. You know, after all the bureaucrats get done bureaucratizing this thing to death, um, I said it months ago that whatever Biden comes out with. As long as the threat of bankruptcy remains gone, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but whatever we see Biden do is probably going to wind up ultimately coming to mean almost nothing for almost everyone and absolutely nothing for many. And, and you know, I, I should say people that have these FFELP loans, they tend to be older borrowers who yep. borrowed money decades and decades ago, they probably owe hundreds of thousands of dollars despite borrowing a tiny fraction of that many decades ago. So these are the worst hurt people and they are like all the pandemic stimulus, they are out in the cold, left out uh, out in the lurch. And, you know, it's, it's disgusting and it's obscene. That's right. That's right. Uh, for those who are are just joining, uh, we were just talking about the news that broke uh, today in reference to the student loan forgiveness plan that now there has been a change. And basically people uh, who had federal student loans, but they were held by private lenders will now be excluded from that debt relief. So uh, unless they had consolidated those loans before today, which obviously this news broke today. So it's already too late for them to go ahead and, and do that. And I want to get your take on the student loan industry altogether, because I've called out uh, organizations like Sally May over a year ago uh, as a predatory lender. And, and I found out about their, their practices uh, about three years ago. They actually came to Boston University. Uh, a couple of their representatives spoke to uh, a student group that we were working with at that time that was going to work with them on a project. And one of their representatives made the mistake of saying, well, we have people on the Hill that make sure that people like us stay in place. And they were talking about predatory lenders like Sally Mae. Uh, so that was a big turnoff to the students, obviously, and also to me. And that right there let me know like what they're really all about here. And you have people in D.C. that are working to keep them in place. So even when Joe Biden promised to cancel this $10,000 to $20,000 student loan debt, I knew, I said, watch, there is going to be a catch because they always make these promises to us. And then there's always something that was either unchecked or a loophole that they were able to, or, or they weren't paying attention to that is going to make it less than what it already is. You hit it right on the head. And I can only hope that people are starting to wise up to this lending scam. You know, there's no other loan in this country from which bankruptcy protections have been removed. Statutes of limitations have been taken away. Um, truth in lending laws, fair debt collection practice laws, all these consumer protections have been taken away from federal student loans. And the lending industry, Sally Mae, Navient, uh, all the, the whole laundry list, 
up to and including the federal government, by the way, the Department of Education owns the majority of these loans now, and, and they are partners in crime with these for-profit and sometimes non-profit entities. Um, the lending system is a catastrophic failure at this point. Um, it's predatory, it's abusive, and by the way, almost every penny of federal student loans could be canceled tomorrow, and the taxpayers would be breaking about even. They have been making a massive profit on this scam for decades and decades and decades. You know, the founding fathers called for uniform bankruptcy laws in the Constitution, and they took this away from student loans. And you take away bankruptcy and you take away statute of limitations, well, you can follow borrowers for the rest of their lives. And when you can snag their social security income, their disability income, you can garnish their wages without a court order. These are licenses to steal. And that is what has happened. Now, now thankfully, Sabrina, I have to say, I, I've found my sense of humor about this over the past three years because the numbers at this point are so freakishly just outrageous. The lending system is toast. It's, it's finished. It's done. There, there's no saving it, and there should be no saving it, no matter how hard the people in Washington, D.C. try. You know, even before the pandemic, more than half of all borrowers had stopped paying. They can't pay, unable to yep. pay, refuse to pay, whatever you want to call it. Um, the default rate, even before the pandemic, uh, was 40 percent, but that was for 2004 students. And they were borrowing a third as much as what's being borrowed today. So everybody walking around with student loans right now, I think the default rate is going to be something like 70, 75%. Um, and even uh, the guy who ran the federal lending program uh, before the pandemic, again, he ran it under, it was a Trump appointee, a Republican. Um, he said that 85% of all borrowers were underwater on their loans. So more than half, we already know, were not paying at all. Um, and another 30, what, 5% were paying and paying and paying, but their loan balances were going up and not down. So this lending system is finished. You know, I, January 1st is going to come and maybe 20% of the people will resume pain. I think it's going to be even lower than that, though. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in uncharted territory. Um, lending systems fail from time to time historically, but we haven't seen anything quite this big since like the subprime home mortgage crisis. But this is a little different from subprimes. But anyways, yeah, the lending system is it's just toast and nobody knows how this is going to go. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, something, too, that I've noticed, if, if you talk to people that attended college, like maybe in the 70s and they took out student loans, they do not have anywhere near as much student loan debt that we have, like at least for my generation, those of us are millennials. And I'd say for the Gen Z students as well, uh, they didn't have to borrow as much money because college wasn't as expensive. Right. Some of them were able to work a part-time job to pay for like their books, help pay for part of their tuition. I had a part-time job in college that was never enough money to cover my tuition. And then you were only allowed to work a certain number of hours a week, especially if you had work study, they would only give you so many hours a week. So it wasn't, it was never enough to even put towards the tuition portion. Uh, it was enough to put towards some of my books, but not like all of it. But when we talk about the scam aspect of the student loan industry, I really like to point to the interest rates as, as a big problem because I'm talking to people over the years who maybe had like $40,000 of student loan debt and they had already paid like $35,000 of their student loan debt and they're still telling me they still owe $40,000. And I feel like that's part of the scam portion. Like they must have increased the interest rates over time because a lot of the people that said they did take out student loans like back during the 70s, it wasn't to the amounts uh, that we had or the interest was not as high. And I want to get your opinion about that. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I might even add when they when they created the Higher Education uh, Act, when they passed the Higher Education Act 1965 and created the federal student loan program for all intents and purposes, they declared that the loans would be free of interest. Mm. That's what they said. Now, today, about one hundred billion dollars a year in interest alone clicks off on the federal uh, student loan portfolio. So that one point six trillion dollars that we hear about or seven or eight or whatever it is. Um, that is almost all interest 
penalties and fees. It's not unpaid principal. So when people say, oh, it's going to cost the taxpayers all this money to cancel the loans. No, it's not. That's nonsense. Uh, the taxpayers will be breaking about even if all the loans were canceled tomorrow. But, you know, the, the interest rate is not good. And it's getting worse, by the way, as the prime rate and LIBOR rises, um, so too will the interest rates on student loans going forward. But, you know, it's not just the interest, it's also the fees. You know, a lot of people like to consolidate their loans, consolidation fees. When you fall, if you fall into default on your loans, which the vast majority of people are going to do right now, yep. um, everybody with student loans right now, the vast majority will wind up in default based on all the numbers that we're seeing. That is where they can really turn a you know thirty thousand dollar loan into a hundred hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar monstrosity, and you know I, I have to say Sabrina I think that's more a feature than a bug. I think this was planned. I mm -hmm. think there are people in Washington D.C. who love uh, stealing money from the citizenry. I mean this, that's what this is. It's legalized theft. If what they were doing with student loans, if they did with any other commercial loan from Wall Street, those people would be locked up and thrown in prison. Um, it, it is just absolutely insane, the sort of abuse that we're seeing these days. You know, we have people who borrowed, I mean, you name it, a $50,000 loan. People have repaid $150,000 or $200,000, still owe you know $200,000 on the loans. Those are the sorts of numbers we're seeing. And this loan, this Biden student loan cancellation, even if it was exactly everything it was billed to be, it would do nothing to solve this problem. I also felt like it's a ploy to get people to join the military industrial complex, too. I, I remember yeah. when I was an undergrad, the recruiters heavily <laughs> came to my campus uh, and would tell students, if you join the military when you graduate, guess what? We'll pay off your student loan debt. And so I had friends that did that only for that reason, not because they necessarily wanted to fight for their country, but because they wanted that student loan debt paid off. And they're like, this is a guar guaranteed employment. I don't have to really go out and look for a job and they're going to take care of my my college debt. So that was a, a big factor, I would say, for the armed uh, forces, trying to get those college students, uh, recruit them, and then even offer to them, well, since you have a college degree, you'll start off at a higher rank than someone joining the military uh, right out of high school. So that's another aspect I feel like they realized that military uh, recruitment was going to decrease at some point in time because you, you started to have more people going to college. So what better way to get more people uh, recruited into the military industrial complex than to offer to pay off their student loans? Yeah, it's 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 coercion in many different ways. And I should say, we have so many veterans in our group. We've got over a million people in our group at this point. And there is a very significant spike in veterans. So people who they got the GI Bill. But I'm telling you, the GI Bill does not go as far as it used to. And mm -hmm. some, some of the worst colleges, they target veterans. They're like, hey, you just got out of service. Hey, why don't you come to our pardon my French, shitty college and get a nonsense degree that sounds good, but it's not. Or sometimes even active duty, you know, they go off on deployment and their wife, their husband, significant other um, don't take care of things for them and their line, their loans wind up in default. You know, I don't know. There's a lot of different factors uh, going on there, but I can tell you that uh, our uh, service men and women, including mostly veterans, are being wrecked worse than most people uh, by these loans. Agreed. Um, I want to get your take about the the employers as well, because I did notice that something happened around 08 during the housing crisis. All of a sudden, these entry level positions, which a lot of us just graduated from from college, we typically would have been eligible for those positions. The requirements changed. It went from all you need to have is, is a bachelor's degree to get this position to you need to have a bachelor's degree and three to five years of experience. So what ends up happening was, especially during that time, during that housing crisis, people were afraid to quit their jobs. So people that were at retirement age that could retire were like, I better hold on to this position because the economy is in the pits. So then what happened was you had people that were Gen Xers, so to speak, they were getting those entry level jobs that technically 
those of us who are millennials graduating from college, we should have been eligible for those jobs. So since they had those jobs and they had years of experience, that actually increased the experience uh, requirement for those entry level positions. And I, I worked with college students for, for years, for over a decade, and now it's even higher. Now they're asking these kids to have five years of experience. So now you have kids graduating from undergrad and they're like, well, I need to go to grad school to get a, a higher degree. That's another way to bypass it, but you accumulate more student loan debt and the wages that they're offering uh, these, these recent graduates are not enough for them to live off of on their own. A lot of these kids have, have three and four roommates and they have college degrees. So I feel like it seems like all of these pieces have been working together. Yeah, they absolutely have been. And, you know, the, the vast majority of people who got caught in the 2008 um, bad economy, vast majority of them owe more today than they did back in 2008 on their student loans. Yep. This cannot, it cannot continue. It can't. Um, and as I said, I, I've kind of found a sense of humor at this point because the lending system is off a cliff. Um, if even 20% of the people resume paying on their loans come January, that'll be pretty surprising. Um, you know, lending systems fail from time to time. And this one is, is way past failed. It, it's done. Um, hey, one very important thing. We've got to return bankruptcy protections to these loans because yep. when January does start and nobody wants to file for bankruptcy, I get that. But stripping bankruptcy away lies at the core of this scam. And the only way that we're going to see any kind of fairness, fair administration, good faith loan administration for these loans is when we, the people, have the leverage of bankruptcy back on our side, just like it is for every other type of loan, for every other type of borrower. So that's the core focus of, of our group. And I'm very glad to say that today a bill dropped in the House of Representatives. I don't have a number for you yet. Um, it doesn't have one, probably won't until tomorrow, but this is a companion bill for a Senate bill, S-2598. Um, so I am guardedly hopeful that we can get the Democrats who have a historically rare control of both House, Senate and presidency right now. That hasn't happened since Obama. Um, I'm guardedly hopeful that, um, and it's a bipartisan bill, guardedly hopeful that we can maybe push this bill through ideally before November 8th for political purposes. But um, by the end of the year, I think we've got a really good shot. Yeah, it's uh, this is what I, I like to tell people also about the activism on the outside. So Alan is a part of the student, student loan justice organization. They put a lot of pressure on the politicians. So I know, Alan, you've been fighting about this for years. <laughs> like you've been talking about this for a long time before this was even, uh, I, I guess I would say a popular conversation, so to speak. So you had already seen what was happening. Um, I was at an event uh, recently uh, called Camp Dada and we had a debt burning uh, event. Right. And everyone that stood up to speak, it was student loan debt, I think for, except for one person. And it just goes to show you how this debt has really put a weight on people's lives. And I don't think for people who did not have to take this on, they don't really understand. You know, people who never had student loans or maybe who paid off their student loans years or decades ago, they have no idea. People who went to college in the night in the 70s, that's chump change, you know. Um, you used to be in the seventies, you could, you know, work a part-time job over the summer and pay your tuition. Yep. We're, we're in a different reality today and people need to understand that this is not a bad borrower problem. You can wag your finger at the borrowers all you want. And that's not going to change the fact that this, this lending system is failed and it's not the borrowers that crushed, uh, this lending system. You know, I like to say, um, we didn't break this lending system, we the borrowers. This lending system tried to break us, and we're not doing it. Um, I think the people are far stronger than the people in Washington, D.C. give us credit for. I agree. And I want to get your opinion about uh, the Debt Collective. They have been uh, pretty vocal on Twitter, and I've seen them on other shows as well. They are asking people, come January, not to start paying back their student loans. And I, I want to get your opinion about that. Well, I think that's inevitable, inevitable at this point. And in my humble opinion, no one should ever pay another dollar into this beast. Um, it doesn't help them. It doesn't help the country. It doesn't help the people in Washington, D.C. It's, 
It does nobody any good to pay into this lending beast. Don't feed it. This is a lending beast that should be taken to the bath and drowned in the tub, quite frankly. And, you know, uh, Debt Collective likes to call it a strike. We're not talking about a strike here. We're not like, oh, do something. And when our demands are met, we'll start paying again. No, no. This lending system is finished. Um, there's there's no saving it and there should be no saving it. The one thing um, that we differ from the debt collective on, and I don't know why, but they seem to be uh, quiet on the bankruptcy issue. And, you know, January 1st is rolling around and the collection industry, at least on paper, you know, they still have a lot of collection powers and, you know, people, um, I tell everybody to bulletproof themselves, get ready for January. Um, but how much better it will be when January 1st rolls around and we have the leverage of bankruptcy back on our side. That is absolutely critical. <clears throat> but yeah, no, this uh, call it a strike, call it whatever you want. I think strike's the wrong word. The lending system is vanishing into a mist of illegitimacy as we speak. Student loans are essentially, um, essentially dead. It's a dead man walking. The pandemic, I think, was the nail in the coffin. I agree. I agree. Uh, the other thing I've wondered too, what happens to someone that has or still has student loan debt? And let's say that person passes away. What happens to that debt that is still owed? Like what did the student loan companies do about that? Well, federal student loan debt is discharged uh, upon death. Um, private student loans, the cosigners um, typically are still held on the hook. Uh, but let's not uh, let's not let our uh, passing be uh, how we solve our student loan problem, shall we? <laughs> right, but it, it to to the point it shows that they can charge it off. They can, I mean? they can, and they do. You know, um, the president has all the executive authority and the secretary all the executive authority they need to waive, compromise, and release the federal interest in these loans. President Biden could cancel every nickel of federally owned student loans. That's around 87% of all student loan debt. He wouldn't, and unlike PPP loans, he wouldn't need one dime from the treasury. You wouldn't have to print any money. Um, you wouldn't add even a penny to the national debt and not one dollar would be injected into the economy to cause inflation. So all the haters out there, um, these are swamp creatures in Washington, D.C. that are trying to protect their cash cow. They are just full of nonsense. And I think people are smarter than that. I hope you can see through it. I hope everybody out there will see through this Washington, D.C. and Wall Street spin that the media has been overtaken by. Do you think there should be some type of action towards uh, universities for price gouging in reference to uh, tuition as well, because that's the one piece I think that is is not being addressed as much is that, yes, I think we should cancel all student loan debt, but at the same time, these universities are increasing tuition every year. Uh, I, I'll give you an example of, of local colleges here. Uh, Boston University is more expensive to attend than Harvard University now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like $65,000 to go there. It's ridiculous. Uh, University of Massachusetts is almost $30,000 a year. That's a state school. So they're they're continuing to increase the tuition. <clears throat> and at the same time, these kids in high school are like, well, I have to go to college if I want to have a good job. But do you think that's necessarily true? Because I, I've seen people just attend like two years of community college. They'll become a dental hygienist, uh, very little debt, and sometimes given grants to go to the community college. And they're making more than some of the students that are graduating with a bachelor's degree. Yeah, you know, I think just generally college is a little bit oversold uh, to the kids. You know, everybody has it drilled into them from a young age. Oh, go to college. You want to be somebody, go to college. It's oversold. It's extremely overpriced. And despite what the colleges may say, they love to cry poor. They're like, oh, state cut our funding. That's nonsense. Colleges are more awash in cash today than they have ever been in the history of colleges in this country. Um, by the way, our, our bankruptcy bill I mentioned earlier, um, there's a clawback provision in it, which requires the colleges to reimburse the lenders um, and federal government um, in the case of a bankruptcy discharge. So it's not a huge amount, but it's 
a little bit of a slap on the wrist. I think certainly the colleges need to bear some li- liability and th- they need to have some skin in the game. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, if I was president, I would suspend the lending program indefinitely, i.e. forever. Um, I would maybe put the colleges on a direct reduced funding, like 70% what they got last year for a year. I would recreate the entire higher education financing system. And that's really what needs to happen in an ideal world. That's what would happen. And but for the but for the bad politics in Washington, D.C., that's what would be happening. What do you say to people who feel that if we made public colleges free, then the degree wouldn't have the same value? And I I argue against that because I point to a country like Germany where college is free and they have some of the best engineers in the world. So I disagree with that statement, but they will argue that some of these other colleges like the private universities, like the Harvards and the Yale, that they wouldn't have uh, good attendance. And I wanna get your opinion about that, that it would hurt uh, the education system, so to speak. Oh, I think that's propaganda seeded by the by the colleges themselves, quite frankly. And it's like, it's like you said, look at, almost every first world country in Europe, look at China, look at, you know, even some second world companies, uh, countries, uh, you know, Cuba, Mexico, uh, Venezuela, you know, college is free in most countries on earth at this point, certainly public colleges. There's no good reason that we, we, the supposedly the richest, most powerful country in the world can't find a way to educate our citizens. uh, If not completely free, at least, um, you know, free tuition at a minimum for public colleges and universities. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the college industrial complex, um, they love this government lending scam. It's their cash cow. Yes. And, and then the way that they use the resources at universities as well. Like I went to, I like to call them sports schools. I went to a, a, a SEC school, uh, University of South Carolina heavily into sports, football, uh, basketball team. Like there's a lot of money put into that. Some of these coaches at these colleges are making over a million dollars a year. So you have to ask like, why is there no accountability with the way that these universities choose to spend the funds that come into the university? I I know, you know, it's like I said, the colleges are, they are essentially given a license to steal. Not and not not only through the lending program. But there's other ways that colleges make money through land acquisition and sales, so forth. Um, and just look at any college, including community colleges all over the country. If you drive past your local college, and you'll probably see one, two, three construction cranes because they're building, baby. Mm-hmm. They are building climbing rock walls and class A architecture and all these things that have nothing to do with teaching and learning. That's um, right. So that's maybe another that's discussion. Right. I could go on for a while, though. The college endowments have grown to just obscene proportions. And beyond the endowments, by the way, the colleges for the past 15 years have begun b- begun socking away money um, separate from their endowments. Some of them mm-hmm. are even putting their money in, you know, Panama bank accounts and so forth. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of uh, outside the endowment wealth that the colleges have um, collectively accrued. And we're talking hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars. That's right. How do you feel about some of these alternative uh, higher ed programs that have have started to emerge, like Launch Academy, uh, General Assembly is a, is a big one. They have like a 98% job placement rate. Uh, you don't have to leave your home to attend General Assembly. It doesn't take you four years to get that degree, probably about two and a half years, and it costs less. Do you think that's going to be the way of the, of the future, these alternative options? Yeah, you know, it's hard to say. Certainly, people can, it, driven people can educate themselves anywhere, anytime, if they really want to learn. That's always been true. Um, The problem I see with some of the free or maybe, um, you know, very low cost online, you know, sit in your living room and um, number one, it's the testing because it's very hard to test for those things in a rigorous way. Um, And number two, there's just the prestige factor. Like we see these billionaires, Peter Thiel, Mark Cuban and others say, oh, don't go to college. 
you know, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And meanwhile, look at their kids. Their kids are going to Yale, Princeton, Harvard. So I think there's always going to be that sort of thing going on as well. Um, but certainly what I can tell you, Sabrina, is that the current higher education funding model is broken beyond repair. And quite frankly, I don't even see the federal lending program even existing in two to three years. Um, when, no, when nobody's paying, does it really exist? You know, I don't, I don't think so. That's a good point. And the point that you mentioned, too, about bankruptcy, I do want to remind everyone that Joe Biden is the reason why you cannot file for bankruptcy for your student loans, because he's the one who who wrote that bill. This is why you can't if you get into some type of financial situation, you can defer or you can apply for a deferment uh, and, and, and hope that that goes through but you cannot file bankruptcy on student loan debt. So it's almost like it's, it really is a weight for people um, that that's pulling a lot of people down. Very true. Joe Biden, in fact, of all sitting serving federal politicians alive today, Joe Biden probably deserves more credit than any living human for removing bankruptcy protections from student loans. This goes back to 1977 as a junior senator. And, uh, you know, he's got a lot to atone for. And I would hope um, the, the DNC, um, to their credit, has included returning bankruptcy to student loans in their party platform. So 2020, 2016. So the Democrats have a promise they need to keep to the citizens. This $10,000 loan cancellation is not that. Um, they pledge to return bankruptcy. They are in a perfect position to do that. Uh, we have a bipartisan bill. You know, we have Republican senators from Texas, uh, Josh Hawley in Missouri, um, Matt Gates in Florida, who most Democrats hate that guy. Um, <laughs> he is for returning bankruptcy to student loans. So there is absolutely no excuse that our Congress can't uh, return uh, this floor of fairness that is bankruptcy rights. And by the way, very few people should even have to file. It's just having bankruptcy back on the table that will force the lenders to behave in good faith, um, rein in the colleges, you know, all these good things that, um, that keep a lending program stable and rational and keep prices low and all the good things that we need to see. That will happen when bankruptcy comes back. Well said. Well, Alan, thank you so much for joining me. Before you go, where can people find you? Uh, studentloanjustice.org. And uh, maybe if they can sign our petition, uh, change.org slash cancel student loans. Um, just Google us. We're pretty much everywhere. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Alan, and educating all of us. Thank you, Sabrina. I enjoyed it. Bye.